Hello everyone. Um, first, I just want to say I hope that you and your family are all doing well. Um, obviously, these are uh, very unusual and trying circumstances for everyone. Um, and uh, I, I hope that everything is well with you and your family. Um, so this is going to be our first lecture, um, our online lecture for uh, History 102. Um, and today we're going to be talking about uh, the year of revolutions in 1848. Um, to make a long story short, in 1848, uh, there was a series of revolutions that threatened the established conservative order in Europe um, and that at, for a moment uh, seemed to threaten uh, a complete overthrow of the political system in Europe, but were, these revolutions were eventually suppressed. Um, two of the important ideologies that influenced these revolutions were two ideologies we, we have already discussed in class, that was liberalism and nationalism. Um, and that these two forces combined, um, along with working class discontent, um, created a series of revolutions in 1848 that uh, spread across the continent um, and almost overthrew the conservative uh, monarchy, monarchy order of uh, Europe. But before we um, discuss the revolutions of 1848 specifically, I want to talk about the emergence of another ideology that is connected with 1848, although not directly with um, the revolutions themselves, and that is communism. Um, there had been various socialist thinkers in the early 19th century um, who had were thinking about new ways in which society could be planned and developed. We talked in an earlier class about how um, the Enlightenment had created the idea that Essentially, society could be made perfect on Earth. That in prior, uh, in medieval Europe, um, people hadn't been overly concerned with perfecting society because they viewed society as a transitory stage towards the afterlife. But the Enlightenment changes people's mindset towards encouraging um, a belief that, yes, on Earth, in our lifetimes, we should make things better. We could make things progressively better for everyone. Um, this inspired socialist thinkers, those who wanted to uh, revolutionized society in the 19th century um, and perhaps the most radical uh, group of socialist thinkers in this regard were communists um, and the third term communism emerges um, in the uh, middle of the 19th century uh, partly because of the work of these two bearded gentlemen here Karl Marx and, and Friedrich Engels. In 1848 Marx and Engels uh, both living in, in the United Kingdom published a book called the Communist Manifesto uh, in which they outline communist thought. And this is the basis for, um, or at least the starting point for communism um, as a political ideology. Um, we'll see over the course of this class that what communism itself actually means kind of evolves and goes in different directions, but the beginning point is with Marx and Engels. So what exactly did Marx and Engels have to say? Their basic argument was that all of history could be viewed as a class conflict for what they call the means of production. Essentially, the means of production were anything you use uh, to produce goods. Uh, so raw materials, money, factories, equipment, all of these things counted as the means of production. And so what they essentially were saying was that if you looked at any conflict in human history, any war, any political development, um, it was always connected to people trying to control the means of production. What Engels and Marx also argued was that all of history, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was an evolution of different groups essentially seizing control of the, the means of production. Um, and that at different ages, different groups controlled the means of production, um, what they referred to as the mode of production. So in other words, at a different era in society, the, there was a, a different class type classification of how these means of production were controlled. Um, so you start in the very beginning, you have hunter-gatherer um, society. Um, Marx and Engels said, well, the mode of production there was subsistence. Um, the next stage in human history was the development of landowning, our aristocracy, controlling society, essentially landed aristocrats controlling the means of production. Um, and Marx and Engels referred to the mode of production to describe that era, which they argued was most of recorded history, uh, as feudalism. So feudalism, large landowners, controlling all the wealth, controlling the means of production. Engels and Marx argued that the aristocrats were overthrown essentially by the French Revolution, that the French Revolution marked the overthrow of the aristocrats by the middle class. 
or the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie. Um, and this marked a new shift in the mode of production. So we shift from feudalism to capitalism. So the victory of the middle classes uh, during the French Revolution and the shift to capitalism, that was the new age of um, human development. It marked another uh, turning point in the in progress of human history. So means of production, anything that you use to produce goods. The mode of production refers to the, uh, the, the general economic system to support that at the time. So as we said, when the aristocrats were in charge, land owning wealth, that was feudalism. Middle classes are in charge, uh, that is capitalism. One other important term just to keep in mind uh, what, when, when Marx and Engels' ideology um, was the superstructure. The superstructure basically meant, and it was connected with the mode of uh, production, basically anything, any kind of ideology, so be it education, family values, political values, culture, all the kind of um, more abstract things in society that supported the status quo. So they would argue that education in the 19th century, political ideology in the 19th century, these are part of the superstructure that supported and legitimized capitalism, according to Marx and Engels. However, they felt that the rise of capitalism was not the final development in human history. That was going to be the uh, rise of the proletarian. That is the industrial working classes, the people working in factories, living in cities. Just as the middle class had taken power from the aristocrats and created capitalism, um, Marx and Engels argued that eventually the proletarian or working classes would take power from the middle classes um, and a revolution that would free all of humanity. Um, this would mark the transition from capitalism to communism. Um, and what exactly did communism entail? Marx and Engels argued that this revolution would end private property. They believed that private property was responsible for creating social distinctions in the first place. Uh, we would have a society that was, would be completely equal without any social distinction. So um, this final stage of revolution in, in, in Marx and Engels' thinking um, was a shift of the mode of production from uh, capitalism to communism um, and the means of production would ultimately be controlled by the working classes, uh, by the proletariat. Just to re-emphasize, Marx and Engels are arguing that this is inevitable, that the course of human history... So Marx in particular was taking a scientific approach to the study of history. He's, he's, he's not saying that, well, we don't know what might happen, what, 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 how history might develop. He's arguing that history inevitably is working towards this socialist uh, revolution. Um, and indeed, the... the most famous statement from his Communist Manifesto uh, was, and I quote, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of the countries unite. So putting out a call for socialist revolution. Um, and um, yeah, and so, so that's essentially what the, the ideology of communism was as, as, as espoused by Karl Marx. The one important thing to keep in mind Today, when we talk about communism, we naturally think of the Soviet Union, we think of Stalin, we think of totalitarian dictatorship. Interestingly, Marx believed that once the revolution had been achieved, once uh, the means of production were controlled by the working classes, the state would actually disappear, um, and and there would be any there would be no longer need for any organized government. Um, so. That, that, I'm not saying that to justify or defend Marx's ideology or views. Um, but just to make the point that what happens, for example, in the Soviet Union, if Marx had been able to come to the 20th century um, and see the Soviet Union, I, I think he would have said, well, that's not exactly what I was talking about. So that exactly was, uh, that's essentially is what communism uh, was, uh, as, as, as espoused by the Communist Manifesto. It doesn't have a significant impact on 1848 itself, but certainly goes on to change um, people's attitudes towards revolution over the course of uh, the next uh, couple of decades. So what happens in New York in 1848? Well, here's a student musing. Another man to influence the state and others was Karl Marx. His ideas about revolution, condos and supermen instead of superstructure, intrigued many. According to Marx, the stages of history are cannibalism, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, and back to cannibalism. These are the moods of production. So, half right. Okay. What exactly happened in Europe in 1848 then? So I just want to begin with an overview of the revolutions themselves or what exactly we're talking about. So in 1848, a series of revolutions across Europe shook the conservative political and social order to its core. That is a revolution that began in France, 
spread to the other uh, kingdoms of Europe. Um, for a brief time, it seemed that it was, it was possible that all the monarchies of Europe, or almost all the monarchies of Europe, uh, would be overthrown. A couple of different factors explain why we get this revolution or these series of revolutions in 1848. One was economic hardship um, that was brought on by poor grain harvests, poor harvests in general in Europe in the 1840s. Um, the potato crop, we mentioned this in an earlier class, the, the, the potato blight, which had particularly lethal consequences in Ireland, uh, but it did spread across Europe. It added to the um, misery and discontent of the... So most peasants in Europe were not solely dependent upon the potatoes, so we don't get mass famine elsewhere like we have in Ireland, but certainly it added to the hardship that many poor people felt. So a lot of people um, are struggling economically, um, a lot of people are struggling to food, a lot of discontent. There's also rising unemployment again because there's an economic downturn in the 1840s and poor living conditions, so people are frustrated, discontent. So in 1848, we have a kind of combination of two different groups who are going to lead the revolution. Uh, one is the, uh, again, the, the working classes of the cities, the poor people of, of, of um, the, the countryside, but they are allied in their efforts to spread revolution by liberals. Liberals want more political power. Some of them are also nationalists, so they either want to unite and create new states, or they want their states to break away from bigger kingdoms. Um, and so these liberals spot an opportunity in 1848 to bring about political change. So you have a combination of poor people in cities and countries who want economic change, liberals and nationalists who want political change, and combined, um, they uh, bring about a series of revolutions that um, threaten the established political order. Um, so together, both groups threaten monarchy in particular. Um, but the fact that Ultimately, there are two or three different different goals for these different groups. Uh, means they're not fully united in what they're looking for, and this ultimately causes their defeat. So that's a broad overview of Europe in 1848. As one person put it, the first thing that makes the 20th century the most violent period in human history was the year of revolutions in 1848. I once had a student give that answer um, in an essay, and I, I, I assume they didn't fully understand that 1848 did not take place in the 20th century.